All right, so we're going to go ahead and continue on now that we sort of have the basics of what Congress is, who is in Congress, how how we determine who's in Congress, things like that. We're going to continue into what Congress does. So we're talking about the powers of Congress. And you can see here sort of the direction that we're headed. Um, today, the focus is going to be on the express powers of money and commerce. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So these are... These are the different powers uh, that are given to the con to, to Congress and the Constitution. Um, and there's three specific ways that power is granted to Congress. In other words, power is, uh, is, is given to the federal government, but it's given to the federal government in very uh, explicit ways. And the, the three ways that it is given are, are listed there, the express powers, the implied powers, and the inherent powers. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time today on uh, a couple of sp specific instances specifically relating to finances today um, and these are things that are all written into the Constitution in other words there's no there's no question about it there's no uh, there's no guesswork there's no wondering these are powers that Congress has now we're actually going to begin with that bottom one though because it, it's one that we can sort of uh, dispense with very quickly, and that's the inherent powers. These are very simply just powers that the government has simply by existing. Um, in other words, and you can see the example there, uh, the power to control uh, to control the national borders. Okay, and there there's sort of the, a, a typo in there in the line, but the power to control national borders simply by existing, simply by being a government, by being a country, we have borders and we have, the federal government has the right to control those borders. Um, so in other words, uh, the different states along the Canadian and along the Mexican border, they cannot have, uh, they cannot sort of have their own criteria uh, for who gets in and who doesn't. That is a power that is controlled by the United States, by the federal government. Um, and and it, it has that power simply because the, the government of the United States exists. And that's what the inherent powers are. Um, we're not going to really go into a whole lot more detail about it, partially because it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a relatively simple concept, um, and, and partially because the other two, uh, the other two types of powers are, uh, are, get a little, a little bit trickier. So we can go ahead and get the inherent powers out of the way right now. They, they exist. We have these powers. The government has these powers, rather simply because the government exists. Now, the express powers, which is what we're going to spend most of our time today on, um, or actually the rest of our time today on, and specifically the express powers as it pertains to uh, finances. Um, as you can see there, the, the commerce power and the power of the tax, and then there's even a few uh, sort of tacked on there at the end. Uh, there are 27 such powers in the Constitution. In other words, there are 27 things that are written into the Constitution, things that, uh, things that Congress can do, okay? things that the government can do. Uh, now, two of these, again, the commerce and the power to tax, those form the basis for a lot of the implied powers that we're going to cover, that we're going to cover next week. Um, but because they form the base, it's sort of where we're going to start. And that is the commerce power and the power to tax. Now, the commerce power, and you have it defined there uh, down to the article, the section, the clause. Uh, and this is taken directly from the Constitution. It says the Congress has the power to, quote, regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes, unquote. So that's pretty straightforward. Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate. Those two bodies together, Congress, has the power to sort of watch over and maintain and create rules to govern commerce between four nations, to govern interactions between the states that are in the Union, and then also to govern trade with Native American tribes. Now, that last point, uh, sadly, to some extent, no longer is really applicable. It's something that we don't really have to deal with a whole lot anymore, despite uh, the existence of the reservation system and things like that. Although occasionally you will hear uh, cases pop up in federal, um, 
in, in, in federal court that have to do with the government and the relationship to these Indian reservations and things like that. But we're going to focus on mainly commerce with foreign nations and, and commerce between the several states. And commerce is defined down there in that second bullet point. Very simply, it's just trade. Okay. Um, very simply is the exchange of money um, for goods or the exchange of one type of good for another type of good. Um, that That is commerce. It is simply trade. Now, the commerce power, then, is defined as the government's ability to regulate that trade. Um, specifically, two instances that it's very important are interstate. In other words, um, the trade that takes place between the states of the United States of America. Um, so, for example, uh, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about a court case that actually involves um, a state versus a federal issue. Uh, but this is the this is what this is where we get the the federal rules and regulations as it as it pertains to uh, goods that cross over state borders. Um, I've told this story before that when I worked at the ice plant um, here in Attica, I worked as a delivery uh, as a as a as a truck driver where I would take and I would deliver ice to uh, to, to different you know uh, to different convenience stores and grocery stores and gas stations and things like that. And at the time, and I don't know if this is still the law of the land or not, but at the time, you could not transport goods for sale over state lines unless you were 21 years of age or older. Um, and, and because of that, and because I was one of the few drivers who was over the age of 21, I ended up actually doing a lot of my, my work at the ice plant in the state of Illinois. Um, that is a law that is handed down from the federal government. Um, now, the specifics of that law in particular and why they say you've got to be 21, I really don't know. But um, that is within the power of the United States. Indiana can't just say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but um, we will allow anybody who is, you know, regardless of their age, we will allow them to transport goods to other states, to Illinois, to Michigan, things like that. The state can't do that, okay? Um, this is not one of those, not only is this a, an expressed power, but this is also an explicit power, okay? Um, and a lot of times the, the two terms are synonymous, meaning that only the federal government has this power. Same way with foreign trade. Um, states do not have the power to, um, states do not have the power to work out um, independent, um, independent terms with foreign nations. Um, it all has to be done fairly. Um, now, there are certain things that states can do to attract uh, foreign businesses to come into their states. Um, that is a little bit different because here we're talking about trade. We're not talking about foreign investment. Um, and there's a ton of questions that arise out of this. Um, obviously, a couple of them maybe have already come to mind. Um, and, and that was partially the intent of the Founding Fathers. The Founding Fathers couldn't, you know, have possibly dreamed of things like the internet, for example. How does, how does something as simple as the internet affect this? Because now, um, you know, from Indiana, I can purchase goods uh, not only from other states at the, the click of a mouse, but I can also put, purchase goods from all over the world with a click of a mouse. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of these legitimate questions, um, they are left up to, uh, the federal government and the definitions of, of those questions and the answers to those questions change pretty rapidly um, as as it as they need to. Um, and you see here, this is the, that case that I was talking about, Gibbons versus Oregon. This is 1824. Um, this is the first Supreme Court case invol involving the commerce power. And basically, what it is is there's a dispute over whether states can restrict who has the right to engage in commerce. Okay, um, in this case in particular. Um, there, one of these parties, I believe it was Ogden, um, had a New York state, um, the state of New York granted him exclusive permission to transport um, ferry boats up and down the Hudson River. Um, Gibbons, this guy named Gibbons, um, he actually gets a federal permit to transport people up and down the river. And Ogden sues him in New York State Court. New York State co Courts uphold uh, 
Ogden's monopoly. It's essentially the state has given him a monopoly on uh, on interstate travel or on travel up and down this uh, this river, which also borders, by the way, uh, to a certain extent, New Jersey. And the Supreme Court stepped in and said that, look, commerce is very broadly defined. And because it's so broadly defined, the federal government can override state decisions in these matters. In other words, states do not have the power to limit commerce. Only the federal government does. Um, and this opens up this question of commerce to really pretty broad definitions, um, especially broad definitions of the power of the federal government um, as it relates to trade. Um, and again, we see that there are certain things that the Founding Fathers could not have imagined, the framers of the Constitution could not have imagined. For example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Civil rights is not something that we typically tend to think of as involving commerce necessarily, but as you can see there, this prohibits discrimination in places of business based on race. Okay, And it is a commerce issue because if you have, um, say, a, a diner, uh, you know, the lunch counter strikes that we'll talk that we we would have talked about in history class last year. Um, that is commerce. People are coming in. People are, are, are wanting to exchange money for a for a good or a service. However, it is you want to look at the provision of lunch. And Congress says, look, you can't prohibit. Um, or excuse me, you can't discriminate in places of business based on something like race. And that is filed under the Commerce Clause. Um, so, again, these are pretty broad definitions at this point in our history, and, and, and it's sort of the natural progression of things. Now, there are limits to the commerce power, and in this day and age, in a lot of ways, the best way to think about these powers is to think about what the federal government cannot do. Um, so the federal government, um, while the powers that they have may seem a bit vague, um, and believe me, they, they are in a lot of cases, um, very firmly, the federal government cannot do these things. They cannot tax exports. They cannot favor one port or one state over another. In other words, they cannot set um, import taxes on one state but not on another. We're going to talk about imports and exports here in a minute. They cannot force ships that are bound for one port to go through another port. Um, in other words, um, the federal government cannot tell you as a, a merchant who's bringing goods in from another country, well, you have to bring them in through this port before they can go to to the port that that, that they are um, that they are bound for. And the last one there, which is null and void um, at this point in history, is that Congress cannot interfere with the slave trade. Now, obviously, the slave trade that's that's been what they call dead letter now for for almost two hundred years. Uh, but there are some 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 pretty firm limits on the commerce power. Now, the power to tax. Um, goes back to the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation, uh, just as a quick refresher, did not give the federal government the power to tax at all. Um, and it was one of the key reasons why the Articles of Confederation failed miserably. So the Constitution grants the federal government the power to get taxes from its citizens. And this is a pretty big deal because roughly 90, 95% of the money brought in and used by the United States annually is going to come from taxes. Okay. Um, now, you see the definition there of taxes. Taxes are not just money that's raised um, for, uh, for the government to use however they want. It has to be used for public benefit, okay, um, to serve the public needs. And we're going to talk about some of the different things that we, that we funnel uh, tax money into later. But again, we, it's easier to pay attention to the limits on this power. You can only tax for public purposes. You cannot use tax money for private benefit. Again, do politicians push the bounds of this? Absolutely. Um, once again, you cannot tax exports. Um, direct and indirect taxes, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but direct taxes are taxes that have an even application in terms of, um, you know, taxes that are leveled, levied directly to um, an individual. Okay. Indirect taxes are taxes um, that are, are not direct, essentially. Um, and, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later. Um, I'm going to have to kind of cut it off there uh, because my time on this video is short. Uh, but make sure you do the assignment that goes along with this video. Um, and I'll see everybody on Thursday.